What's good, guys? This is Vahography Talk. This is number 36. And today it's a special one. The featured guest, Mr. Steve Perry. Chuck with me. Hey, Chuck. Hello, everyone. And what's going on, Steve? Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. This looks like it's going to be fun. Looks like there's a lot of comments already, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> man. Yeah, I've been, uh, you know, watching you for some time now. And thank you. you know, yeah. I mean, it's great what you do for the community, you know? So, I appreciate it. Thank you. It's a lot of work, but it's, it, it is fun. It's yeah. rewarding. So what you've been up to, man, these days? Oh, let's see. I just came back from a month long trip to Africa and just, uh, we had two workshop groups there, uh, saw just tons and tons of wildlife, like literal tons. Cause they were elephants. They're big. But uh, yeah, no, we had a uh, we had, we had a we had a good time. Uh, we were shooting all along the river. We were in the Okavanga Delta. So, uh, oh my gosh, between the two groups, just about everything you can imagine. Uh, you know, everything from elephants and hippos to leopards and lions and all the different birds and stuff in between. So it was it was a good trip. It was a good trip. Long one, but it was good. Nice man. I want to welcome everybody streaming in right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again. We got Steve Perry in the house live. We're going to get to some of your questions in a second. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, man, I've like I said, I'm an event wed wedding portrait concert photographer, mm -hmm. but I have these long lenses and I love these long lenses. I have them for fun and stuff. <laughs> they are fun, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they are. I want to ask you one qu uh, first question from me. Uh, sure. How do you like that 800? Oh, PM. everyone wants to know how I like that 800, I think. <laughs> uh, I still like it. I still like it. I got to use it in Florida, as you know. Uh, I was uh, one of, I guess, two people in the United States that got to use it. I did kind of mess up a little bit because I forgot to sniff it, blow on it, and lift it like a, you know, like, a, you know, do bicep exercises with it. But other than that, I think the view is okay. But uh, no, I got to use it for a little bit. And, you know, my initial impression seemed... In, if you saw that review, they were pretty much spot on. Um, everything I thought about that lens initially kind of has panned out. I've shot, I wish I should have, I should have checked, but it's probably between 10 and 20,000 photos with that lens so far. A lot of those in Africa and my initial impressions were still spot on. I really, really like it. Um, in fact, let's see here. Uh, there's a, there's a question here about the 800 autofocus as fast as Sony 600 F4. Um, I have not done like a strict side-by-side -side test, but the 800's AF speed doesn't hold it back at all. It seems like it's as fast as it needs to be. Again, I haven't tested it exactly with the 600 F4 Sony, but my guess, if I have seen of the pants estimate, I, you know, I don't think there's much of a difference or if it is, I mean, we're talking, you know, a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second, I think. I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, but it, it doesn't, it's not like you press the AF button on and it's like slog it along like sometimes the, uh, s some of the, uh, like a 200 to 500 or something would do. So no, it's, uh, it, it's quick. It's quick. But yeah, overall, really like the lens. Definitely. Nice, nice. You can't beat the weight. And how about the price? The price, the price surprised me. Uh, it was actually kind of fun because I knew the price like a month before everybody else did. And they're all speculating in there like $10,000 or $12,000 <laughs> because the five, six is, you know, up there. Yeah. And, and I'm sitting there like, I just, when they told me the price, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're gonna sell. the first thing I told the night guy to rep is, is like, oh my gosh, you guys are not going to be able to keep up with the orders for this lens. And, you know, they, they, I think that's kind of predictable regardless, but still this, in this case, I mean, it is an incredible bargain for what you get. It's uh, the hand holdability of it, as I've said in the other in my other review, is just fantastic. It's still not, it's not like holding a 500 or a 300 PF. It's, you know, a 500 PF, you can kind of hold that all day long. The 800 still has some heft to it, especially when it's attached to a three pound Z9. But, you know, it's still easier to hand hold than like a 600 F4. And I can hand hold it, even if I'm getting fatigued, I can still hand hold it for a pretty long duration without, you know, buckling under the, under the weight <laughs> of it and it's small it's uh, it's very versatile you can get into tight spots the vr is still really i'm still very impressed with that i think i'm trying to think uh, what my current record is i think i've gotten stuff at 60th of a second handheld with that 
Wow. And they they said, all of them. <laughs> not every shot at 60. Don't read something there that's not. Right. But, you know, I'll take a burst. You know, anytime I'm in a real slow shutter speed like that, I take kind of a longer burst because I know most of them are going to be garbage. And then I'll tediously go through in Lightroom one after the other and find the one that's sharp. But, uh, you know, you see really great detail. Even at those slower shutter speeds, you see, you know, like if you're looking at a bird's eye, you're seeing all the skin around that orbital ring. You're seeing all those little dimples in there. You know, you're seeing every little eyelash. Very well defined on you know mammals and that it just you know it's as sharp as i want it to be and so, uh, and to have that that size and that weight right there it is it's a it's still a little bit weird to use it it's to have that kind of focal length just like tossing it around like it's nothing i don't size, think I, I still don't think i've used that thing on a tripod wow yeah. so, size and weight and price now i get a lot of questions saying hey well it's a pf you know mm -hmm. the five six eight hundred is the lens any diff like what are the diff major differences you see on these two that expensive lens, which is sixteen thousand dollars? Well, yeah, versus... yeah, you have like you know it's f six three versus five six, obviously, and that's that's a third of a stop, you know. And, you know, at that point, the the VR in my mind makes up for it at least on your end. You know, obviously, a VR is not going to do anything to help keep the animal still, but you know, it, it, you know, you, most of the time our shots aren't made by. A, are, you're not going to make it or break it by a third of a stop. So for me, the six three is yeah, it's it's fine. I think that's um, what people were scared of six three for some reason. Talking about low light photography and everything else. Right, right. It's you know six forty versus eight hundred ISO. I mean, it's not really that big of a deal, and you know it just it's just a little bit different. You know, and because the VR works so well, as long as the animal is stationary enough and still enough. You know, maybe you're at a thousandth of a second. Maybe you go down to eight hundredth of a second or something like that instead. And that, there's your third of a stop. You've just made it up. You know, okay. it's probably not going to make much of a difference. And in, in in the real in real world shooting, it's not made a difference. Okay. I've not been pining away for my six hundred f four and teleconverter. Going, oh man, I wish I had my, you know, five six. You know, it is what it is. It's yeah, a third of a stop is not that big of a deal. So yeah, there you go, folks. We can kind of put that to rest. Yeah, I don't think it's not been a big deal for me. Let's put it that way. Yeah, but the biggest the biggest thing I hear people saying is, well, the background blur looks better on the the expensive version, you know, than the. You know, the, it might, I've never had the opportunity to use the eight hundred five six. I've seen it, I've played with it, but I've never actually used it. I know it it, it weighs slightly less than a Buick, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's not something that I'm really like you know wanting to run out and grab and you know and take out to the field with me, but. Um, you know, not that a lot of people don't. I mean, a lot of people do use it. And, and and it wouldn't surprise me if the backgrounds were slightly better. But I've been very pleased with the backgrounds a lot. And, and I invite people to take a look at some of the shots I have over at my website. You'll have to scroll down a little bit. But uh, I have like a behind the shots story there with a video. And you can take a look at the backgrounds. I've seen a lot of those discussions. And it's funny because I've seen my images also used to say, no, look, the background looks fine here. You know, a lot of getting those nice backgrounds has a heck of a lot more to do with how you're positioning yourself and how the subject is in relation to the background. There's right. a lot of other factors that go into it than just the lens. Yeah. So it's one of those things that, you know, people get a little bit hung up on, on it. Like this is the only thing controlling the background yeah. and it's not, it's like depth of field. You know, everyone's like, Oh, your aperture controls depth of field. Well, yes, it does. But you know, distance kind of plays a role there too. So does focal length. So there's big time. You know, these other factors that people kind of, you know, set aside yep. and the same goes with background rendering. You know, I can get, pretty decent backgrounds with any lens, but it's just a matter of saying, hey, I'm going to move over a little bit so my background's a little more distant, or I'm going to find a subject that's not right smack up against a bunch of sticks. And, you know, so you get things like that. But yeah, for the most part, I've been very happy with the way the background renders, as long as I'm using the lens properly. And I'm going to go ahead and say that, you know, when I have my 600 F4 in teleconverter, because that's how I was getting to 800. You know, I'm not seeing a marked difference between the backgrounds the 800 PF is producing and what I was getting with that 600 F, uh, F4 and teleconverter combination. I'm not like, you know, it's not, if there is a difference, it's not so jarring that I'm, that, that's been noticeable in my photographs, at least not to me. But yeah. my wife the says eight, I'm oblivious to a lot of stuff, so who knows? The 600, <laughs> yeah. you mean, you're at 850 at 5.6, right? With the 8, 840, yep, 5.6, yep. Uh, could you ask, uh, Christopher Jones asked, could you ask, please ask Steve when the Z9 review is going to be ready? <laughs> oh, maybe one of these days. <laughs> I, anyone who knows me knows I like to use the cameras for a while. And the biggest problem with reviews is that they take a lot of time and energy. And I like to have a lot of photos in there. I like to really use the camera. 
But I think the biggest problem is just more of a logistical one this year. And when the Z9 came out, I was right in the middle of writing the Sony A1 wildlife setup guide. So I didn't really get to use the Z9 a ton until after that was finished. I think that was in February sometime. And then I was using the Z9 and I was getting kind of my preliminary thoughts. But the problem is uh, we were talking about this before the uh, the videos, the live stream started. And part of the problem is I live in Northwest Ohio. <laughs> And, and again, not a wildlife photographer mecca. You know, people don't flock here. Well, they do one for a couple of weeks a year for the birds. But the problem is there wasn't a lot of subject variety here for in, in those months. And the subjects that are here look kind of bad. So I'm not really enthusiastic about photographing them. So I didn't get a lot of field time with this lens until probably May and then, uh, or probably mid to late April. And then into May, I was shooting the heck out of it. Uh, not the lens, I'm sorry, the, Z, the Z9. Um but I didn't get a lot of field time with that camera. So I haven't uh, had a chance to, to, to really kind of gather my thoughts on that. And then I have uh, a, a month long workshop that happened in May. And then we're, I have about three and a half weeks off here where I'm, where I'm trying to just get some stuff out and done. And then yeah. next month yeah. I'm gone for a month in Costa Rica. <laughs> so You're a busy guy. After. Yeah, it'll probably be, uh, I'm hoping sometime in August. I'm also working on a Z9 guide. Uh, so I'm writing that too, as I'm working too. And that'll probably, that's probably about uh, uh, a couple hundred pages there. Easy. So, yeah. yeah. So do you <laughs> find a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> you're having to put a lot more effort in the guides and the reviews for the Z9 because of the, uh, I mean, l let's face it. It is a, it, initially it's a complicated camera and most of the people yeah. that buy it and find, they find that out real soon. It's not yeah, just. Yeah. A, they find, sometimes they find out there it's a little more uh, complex than they were anticipating. I, I'm yeah. seeing a lot of people who are coming from something like even a DA50 or maybe even like a D500 or, you know, a camera of that, you know, kind of that mid range, you know, semi pro type camera, then they're jumping into this and they've never shot mirrorless before they, you know, this is their, you know, yeah. they've never had a pro camera before. And all of a sudden they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. This is too much stuff. Well, and uh, we're seeing a lot of that. That's why I'm trying to work on the guide and make sure it's, you know, it's a wildlife setup guide, so it's not covering everything, but I do want to really go over the stuff that I use, why I use it, how I use it, that. but uh, you, it's you, almost rough drafted, so it's getting close. I, <laughs> I got to tell you, I got to tell you, man, your, uh, your personality rocks. You're an uppy kind of guy. Well, thank you. You're just full of knowledge, and that's why you're the most respected in this genre. You know, I've heard so many compliments. Oh, yeah, Steve Perry knows what he's talking about. Well, thank you. Know, you. That's, well, I only you're going to make me blush. I thank only you. take tips from Steve Perry, this and that. So highly respected. And, you know, that says a lot. Robert Wagner says, what is the image stabilization like on the Z7 with the 800p handheld? I have not tested that very much at all. So I'm going to tell you that I, I don't like to tell you things I don't know. So that's one of the questions I, I don't have an answer for. Um, I've mostly been using the 800 and the Z9. I've mostly been shooting the Z9 most right now because I'm working on those guides and working on those reviews. When I do that, I kind of just favor one camera, you know, all the time. So I haven't really used the Z7 very much with the 800 just for that reason. How about the uh, Z6 II? Same, um, same story. I haven't really used it with that at all. That's because the 800 came out and then the Z9 is out. So right. And yeah. And I'm working, I need to get photos for these. Uh, that's, you know, people don't realize like when you're writing these setup guides, you need like lots of photos taken with that camera. And, you know, I, I like to make sure that I'm giving you, you know, like a really high quality images and, you know, I want real great images in there. I don't want people to go, my gosh, I, you know, I could have taken that with my iPhone. So, yeah. you know, when I'm out shooting and especially when I'm working on guides, I tend to, only favor the one camera. So I say as much as I'd like to say that, you know, I've had a lot of time with the Z6 II and the Z7 II on with that 800. I just haven't really used it very much like that. I think my wife's used it a little bit because we were switching on and off in Africa. I was using the Sony A1 to kind of do, uh, you know, comparisons in real time between the two cameras. And um, I think she's used a little bit there, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's been any problems with it, but I say, I just don't have any experience to, 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 to really let you know. Charles Marsh has Steve purchased a Z 428 yet. I have not. I've thought about it. I got to play with one, one of our uh, guests in the, uh, at our workshops had the 428 and uh, wow, <laughs> that thing is just phenomenal. That is a fantastic lens. The only thing that's not the only thing that's keeping me from buying it is the uh, upcoming 600. I don't know what that's mm. going to be, 
but uh, 600 tends to be the focal length that I tend to live at a lot more. So I'm not, uh, uh, as much as I like a 400 to eight, I think that I, I want to see what the 600 is before I make a final decision. But just as a thought though, I think a 400 to eight with, because it has that built-in teleconverter plus an 800 PF. I mean, you're at four, 400, you're at 560 with the teleconverter at F4. And then 800 gets you, you know, at, at 6.3 there, it's pretty close to 5.6. I mean, I, to me, that seems like it would be just a heck of a wildlife combo. So, yeah. well, you're going to become known as the uh, <clears throat> the uh, foremost guide on PF lenses because of your your, your love of the PFs. So, I do like the PFs. Yeah. So there's a question up right now talking about that. Really. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, two kits for Africa. We had the Sony kit, which was the 200 to 600 and the 400 to 8 this time and if i had that to do over i would go back to the 600 f4 but uh the 400 to 8 sony's great lens wonderful but uh i just uh i think i like the other combo a little bit better as far as a nikon kit we took the z9 the z7 II as a backup and we had i had the 800 pf 500 pf and 300 pf that's all i took because i wanted to kind of try that out and I think my, I, I want to say the 800 was my favorite, but I think the lens I used the most was the 500 PF hmm. because it was just a little bit more appropriate focal range for a lot of the stuff that we found. When we were doing smaller birds, the 800 was great. And if we had more distant subjects, the 800 was good, but you had to watch, you know, heat distortion and things like that. You start getting an elephant at a distance where you need an 800 and it's the atmosphere between you is just going to be ugly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I was using it for some tight close-ups. Eventually I'll put some of that stuff on my Instagram, but, uh, and that's at backcountry gallery, if anyone wants to follow me, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, uh, Eventually, I'll put some of those shots up there, too. But uh, right now, I'm still sorting out all those images. But overall, yeah, the PFs worked really well. We use, I used the 300 PF probably about the least, but I did use it. I was really glad I had it along. But in the vein of would I do it again, I, I would not. No, it was too much lens changing between. Well, there was I, I needed too many focal lengths. I always tell people bring a zoom lens and a prime to Africa, and I should follow my own advice. But I did want to try it just to. See. <laughs> but uh, I mean, as far as how the lenses perform, they were great. One of the things I was doing, especially with a three hundred and a five hundred PF, one of the techniques I'm using, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna be responsible for a lot of people losing their hands and arms because I'm gonna explain, t talk about this. But one of the things when I'm in a boat, what I like to do is I like to lean over the boat and I kind of hold the lens down at the water level with a flip screen out. You just go like to auto area AF with, you know, with eye detection. It'll, it, you know, if it's, you know, friendly, if the animals and the eye detection are kind of getting along and then you can just get it real low to the water like that. Of course, there's hippos and crocs in that water. <laughs> you do have to, you know, think about that a little bit as you're doing it. It's like, okay, I might come back as, you know, uh, you, yeah. you know, one handed or, you know, or less, but um but it does make it is nice with the 500 pf because it's so lightweight. You could just you know it's like effortless to lean over and do that. So you're talking about zooms, and uh, Patrick Malloy asked that question. So what zoom would you recommend for somebody that isn't going to invest in all the different focal lengths for wildlife photography? So first, hi Patrick. He's uh, one of the moderators on our message board. Oh, okay, uh, but uh, I think the 200 to 600 range is great. Uh, Nikon has a, has that on their roadmap. Yeah. And right. I hope, I don't know, I, I, I have no information as far as, but you know. When, people are eagerly I, awaiting that lens. Yeah, but I think that's really going to be the ideal one. I can tell you, I'm going to switch over and talk about Sony for a second. One of the, when I was switching back and forth between systems in Africa, one of the things I really, really enjoyed was that 200 to 600. Got mm -hmm. some really great shots. And people are like, oh my God, it's a 6.3. Yeah, it is. And at times when the light's low, you can struggle with it. But the versatility just cannot be understated. And that lens is just so spectacularly sharp. And one of the things I've noticed with the Z lenses is as good as you think a lens can be, Nikon comes out with these Z lenses. It's like, oh, look, it's better. <laughs> so um, I, 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 I am ready to be impressed by their 200 to 600. I can't wait to see that one. A lot of people feel that yeah. way. Right? But I, I, think that, I think for wildlife, to answer the question, though, I think for wildlife, I think that's, you know, kind of the, if you're looking for one lens that can kind of do it all, I think that's kind of where you're looking. Again, that F6.3 is a little bit problematic when the light's getting low because, you know, 6.3. 
And same problem we have with the 800. You know, when the light's getting low, it becomes more of a challenge. But there's things like tripods. Uh, like I say, the 800 has really great VR, and I'm hoping that that carries over to the 200 to 600. So do you so, see any focusing issues at 6.3 versus F4? Uh, with the uh, Xenon? No, not really, no. Okay, good. No, I haven't had any. I, I don't have anything I would attribute to uh, to Aperture on that. The, the mirrorless cameras don't seem to have as much issue with that. Sometimes okay. when you really get... Um, into smaller f stops like f9 like if there's a question right now uh 800 pf performance with 1.4 tc when you're getting into those smaller apertures sometimes it seems like focus is a little less consistent it you know it seems to be a bigger factor though is having a proper exposure versus an underexposed image in the viewfinder okay. when you have a darker image in the viewfinder what happens is because the camera is using that to determine focus if that image is underexposed and on the dark side, the camera's going to struggle more. It seems like as long as I have a proper exposure in the viewfinder, I'm not really struggling with autofocus there. Now, to answer his question, too, he was asking, I think, about the quality of the teleconverter on right. the 800. It's okay. Uh, I found it to be somewhat inconsistent for focusing, but don't read anything in there that's not. I find that to be true with all teleconverters right. versus the bare lens. I, I find that, it, that the consistency just isn't always as good with the teleconverter attached as it is versus the naked lens. And that's, Wait, you're, uh, you're at 1,200? 1,120, I believe, yeah. At, at what? What's the F? Uh, F9. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So, you yeah. know, a, th a third of a stop less than F8, but it's not... Um, it's not terrible uh, if if the light's decent and you have a nice exposure and the camera gets good focus. It looks good. It looks good. I'm not going to say that it's completely invisible, though. I don't think you know. I've heard some people say, "Oh my gosh, it's so great," and it's not bad. It's not bad. I would, would you know, I'll use it. So it's good enough that I'll use it. But I am like super picky, and uh, you know, other people might say, "Oh, this is fine. There's no no problems at all." But to go, to unless go I really, unless I really, the only reason I would use it. Let me put it this way. A lot of times people use this and use teleconverters incorrectly. What they'll do is they'll try to pull a subject that's already too far away and a little bit closer so they can crop the crap out of it later. Right. And that's really not how they're supposed to be used. Ideally is that you want to use them to finish filling a frame. Okay. And when it's used in that vein, I think it works all right. You can like we had a little bee eater and he was just a little bit too far away, put the teleconverter on. And, you know, some of the shots aren't as sharp as I'd like, but others are look absolutely great. I say there's a little tiny bit of inconsistency sometimes when you add a teleconverter. This is and why everybody a loves you. And it's in Africa and there might be some heat distortion. So there could have been other things going on, too. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, overall, I would say if you have the one for, you know, try it on there. It's, it's not it's not bad to talk about what we were talking about. You were talking about VR mm -hmm. uh, the other day. I was shooting at the beach and it was so windy. OK, I oh, had yeah. my 600. <laughs> FL on with the uh with my Z9. It was so windy. The the lens, I had my uh, Pro Media Gear gimbal, mm -hmm. you know, and my Gitso tripod, but I'm getting vibration. Yeah. So it was so windy that I I could feel the sand hitting my face. Yeah. And uh you know, I was doing video and with VR on, that thing is so usable. It is. Like it's so great on the Z9 combo with the 600 FL. It just cuts the vibration like crazy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it yeah. works. It works really well. It works. And I say, and the Z, the native Z lenses are even better. So oh, I see. Would you get the 800 PF now, or wait till the 600 Z comes out? I can. I can only afford one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd wait. I'd wait. Hopefully, um, Nikon's not watching this. Tell, hearing me say, "Don't buy it," <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I would wait. I I, I would because. We don't know what the 600, the problem is, is that we don't know when the 600 is coming. That's the other issue. If it's two or three years away, and, and that's just wild guessing. I have no idea. It could be, you know, next month, but we don't know when the 600 is coming. So that's, you know, that kind of plays in there. But if it were me, I, 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 I'd want more information because if you could only get one, I think the 600 with the, you know, uh, is probably going to be more versatile. And there's, I saw Nikon rumors. There's a rumor that it might have a teleconverter. I don't have any information one way or the other on that. But if it did, you know, that would be even better. So, you know, we'll have to see what happens. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, if it were me, I would probably wait and see if I could. But again, you know, we don't know when that lens is going to be announced. So, all right. So we have the one to 400 uh, F4, or yeah, F4.5 to 5.6. Oh, I like that lens. 
Yeah, I, I have it and I, I love it too. However, you know, the, the new thing on the list of rumors is, and, and we can pretty much expect that it's going to come out soon. I'm not asking you for any information, but the 400 PF, it seems to be a PF. Are you excited about a 400 PF rather than a 500? Uh, the four, 400 millimeter isn't a focal range I use very much. Okay. So I'm kind of, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'd have to see what it is and, uh, and that, but uh, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know as far as excitement level, you know, I, I do have was... a quarter to eight for the Sony because I, there are times I use it, but it's definitely a secondary lens for me. I, I, I think it's surprising. I look more at the uh, 600 and, <laughs> and longer focal range for a lot of what I have to, yeah, I shoot a lot of small birds and things like that. You just need that, that right. extra range. You know, when I'm out west shooting large mammals, you know, I'm very interested in 400 millimeters and okay. uh, and, and 300s and even 500s. That's, you know, I like that a little bit better, but. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah my uh, Yeah. I, th I think it's, it's probably going to be a pretty cool lens. Yeah. Uh, we had a question. Interesting one here. Uh, put this issue to bed about the A1 and the Z9. If you were to compare them autofocus. Oh, shit. Is this, he, I think here it is. <laughs> Steve, is the Sony A1 AF that good compared to the Z9? Some YouTubers say so. Just want an honest answer. Also, is the Z9 weighty problem compared to the modern lightweight mirrorless cams? I'm going to uh, start with the A1 question versus Z9. And I'm going to first start by saying the internet overblows everything. Okay. I've shot them side by side. One of the reasons in Africa we have both kits and the reason I was shooting the first couple weeks I shot exclusively with the Z9, then I switched to the A1 setup for a little bit for about eight or 10 days. And then I went back to the Z9 because again, I need some photos from the Z9. And, you know, using them side by side like that, it was, you know, you know, on, on often very similar subjects, you know, because, you know, we're with groups that we're going, we're not doing unique subjects every day. It's like, oh, look, we're, we're doing turns again or skimmers again or something like that. So, you know, I had the opportunity to use both cameras in a very short duration near, you know, in the very, you know, uh, I'm sorry, in a very short time frame between each other. And basically, I'm going to say, that, yeah, the A1's autofocus is a little bit better in some circumstances. In If you're doing medium to small bird in flights, bird in flight type shots, yeah, I think the A1's a little bit better. And when I say a little bit better, that's all I mean. I don't mean that it's awesome and the Z9 is terrible. I mean that the A1 has an edge and that's all. Uh, if I were a Nikon shooter, I don't think I would be all that eager to go sell all my stuff and buy an A1 just for that little advantage, unless I was doing just nothing but bird and flight shots. Yeah. Uh, I find the A1 seems to pick up the target a little more consistently. And again, don't read something that's not there a little right. more consistently. And it tends to stick on the target a little bit better. But for the most part, almost across the board, I think otherwise, they were pretty much the same. I mean, when I was shooting, you know, I detect was working pretty much the same on them. If you're shooting like a, some kind of an antelope or something like a, you know, Impala or something, uh, you know, it's working pretty much the same. If you're shooting baboons, kind of pretty much the same. There wasn't really for mammals or, or for stationary birds. It just, I, you know, I'm not seeing this big discrepancy between the two cameras. I say, appreciate the, your honesty, really. Seriously. Yeah. You know, and I like them both. You know, I, you know, the A1 is more customizable. So I think that's why more than anything else, I tend to favor it rather than the autofocus. I do like all the customizations I can do. And I wish, and I'm hoping that with some firmware, we'll see that with Nikon too. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, for the most part, with the Z9 out there, I would kind of discourage any Nikon shooter from just jumping to the A1 unless they had a very, very specific reason they needed to. Because they're both really good. Honestly, if they, you know, I don't want to sound like a jerk or anything, but if you're not getting good pictures with either one of those cameras, it's probably not the camera. <laughs> yeah, that would be me. <laughs> you know, they, they both work. They both work very well. I just, uh, you, you know, uh, oh, I think he was also asking uh, Z9 weight. I've talked to people. I prefer the weight of the A1 because I I do like a little bit lighter. I'll, I like things to be as light as I can because a lot of times I'm on aircraft that have you know weight restriction so i like right. small light small and light um but i've also talked to people who say you know what i like the weight of the z9 i think it balances with lenses better i just like the feel of it in my hand i really like having that it feels more stable to them so i think weight is kind of a personal thing so i think what i think about it doesn't really matter it's what you this think is, about it 
this is what I was going to ask you. Uh, Hot Gates asks, uh, is that something that a firmware update you think can fix as far as catching up to if they're behind? To an extent, yeah. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. And there is a new firmware update coming, supposedly 2.1. Yeah, I saw I, that rumor. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe maybe we see something there too. We might. We might. I tell people don't get too excited about those uh second could, place. Could be just ball. bug fixes. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. They're uh they're that's usually not uh that, that usually the way it works, I believe, is the first version is a major update, the second is a minor update, and the third digit is a is a bug fix. So this is this will be just kind of a minor update that might I I don't know what it's supposed to I I saw there was a rumor but I didn't actually read it so I'm yeah. like you know I'll figure it out when it comes out we'll see what it does but I wouldn't get you know to where I'm thinking it's probably a firmware 3.0 update that'll really set that apart but I think like as far as like customization and things like that I think some of those uh, shortcomings that Nikon has at least some of the stuff that I would like to say I don't want to call it a shortcoming but just stuff I would like to see included will probably right. come as firmware updates as far as autofocus I I believe the Z9 has the horsepower to you know compete with the Sony and I say they are close I, I can't yes. emphasize that enough I say because people I don't I'm afraid people are going to take this completely out of context and say Steve says the A1's autofocus is worlds ahead of the <laughs> Z9 and it's not it's it's you know there's a couple there, there's a certain specific instance with birds in flight you know or being birds in flight where I think the A1 still holds an edge <laughs> and that's all that it but, is I mean yeah people keep talking about the AF bird track this and that birds in flight but how about all the other aspects of photography where like the handling the ergonomics of the Z9 just everything that that camera, you know, represents versus these other cameras. I like them all. I've used yeah. them all. Yeah. But I prefer the Z9 because of its body. I like bigger bodies. So. Right. And, and a lot of people do. And, uh, you know, there, you know, I have, I know people that are very interested in a one and they can't get their hands comfortably around the grip yeah. because it's too close to the lens. Exactly. So, you know, it, it all depends what you like. Personally, I like the, uh, you know, I can, I, I, I'm happy with the ergonomics on both. I don't really have a favorite. I like the customization better on the A1. You can do more with it. There's, you know, there's controls on the A1 that the Z9 simply doesn't have. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of stuff you can do with the Z9 that I think there's a lot of stuff you'll be able to do with the Z9. I think they can add some stuff via firmware that will give us a lot of flexibility there. And they're different systems too. And you have to kind of think differently with each one of them. They're a little bit hard sometimes to compare side by side because they aren't exactly the same. And the, and the workflow with the cameras isn't really exactly the same. Remember? Kind of differently with them. So some people are just wired better for Sony and some are wired better for Nikon. And remember as far as Steve, go, yeah, whatever's comfortable, you know? <laughs> remember Steve back in the day, I don't know, in the videos on YouTube, I don't know if you watch a lot of YouTube, but... Um, they were talking about oh Nikon is done. They oh, yeah. sell. remember that? I do. And, and look at them now. You know what I mean? It's like people and, are just and I can't and I can't believe the lenses they're coming out with so fast. Oh, yeah. I mean, right? one of the things I've said, um, you know, and I've said this in my other videos too. It's like, you know, you also don't want to look at it just from the standpoint of a camera system. Or I'm sorry, the camera bodies. You know, you have you have to look at the whole system, you know. How many, you know, because I, I, you know, I'm not trying to pick on Sony here, but I'm going to do a little bit. You know, I don't see a 300 f4 in Sony. I don't see any PF lenses. I don't see a 300 2.8. I don't see a anything in the uh, like 200 to 400 or the 180 to 400 f4 range as far as a zoom. You know, those are all pretty critical. There's no 500 in Sony. No 500 f4. So there's, you know, you know there's a lot of stuff missing in their lineup. And Nikon is really doing well, I think, in the lens department. Not only can you use their old F-mount lenses, yeah. which are great. That 500 PF adapts fantastically to the Z9, by the way. But, you know, yeah. things like a 400 28 with a teleconverter, <laughs> you know, that's great. I've been saying something like that for years. I wish these longer lenses, as soon as I saw those zooms come out with those teleconverters, I was like, man, I sure wish they would do that with the primes. And they did it with the 400 28. And, you know, there's a rumor they might do it with the 600. And that would be that would be fantastic. But just having it as with the 400 to eight, I cannot tell you the number of shots I've missed. Yeah, because well, it's messing with the teleconverter, and I'm pretty quick yeah. with it. I could do it in about eight ten seconds. Nikon uh, has a history of lens making. I mean, oh yeah, they do. They, they they're more of an optical company than a camera company, I think. But they are yeah. just oh my gosh. I say the stuff they're and and, and like I say this 800 pf. I mean, you see, they're coming out with these really fantastic lenses that give you uh, a real advantage in the field. And, 
Hey, they're, they're, you have they're, to look at that whole package when you're considering systems, yeah. you know. And Nikon's really, I think <laughs> Nikon really has an edge when it comes to lenses. Hey, but re, re, honestly, they're really sticking it to the other makers, right? With the price of the Z9 and they 800, are. <laughs> 800 PF, it's like boom, boom, uppercut, you know, jab, boom. Yeah, I, I, I've been. I was surprised at the price of the Z9, but shocked at the price of the 800 PF. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, you guys. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the 100 to 400 native with the TC 1.4 for wildlife? That's a good question. I have not used that combo very much because I have a 600 to 400 to 500 PF. Most of the time, I don't like to use teleconverters if I don't have to, but I have used the 100 to 400 quite a bit for wildlife. I have some uh, some bird and flight shots I've taken with it. Just absolutely love. I had some Inhingas that were coming in back and forth and uh, just really, really like that shot. And it was just, it was too hard to try to do it with a prime because they're changing size as they're coming back and forth. So the zoom made it really nice. And I've used that zoom for, you know, other uh, various little bit, bit of wildlife here and there. And it's just been, it's been really good. But I don't like the idea of adding a 1.4 teleconverter to a lens that's already at 5.6 because that's putting me at f8. And I'm not really like, an, you know, a 5.60 at f8 just isn't really, you know, ringing my bell. Yeah. So especially when I have a 600 f4 and a 500 pf sitting in the bag. <laughs> so I don't so I don't use that combo very much. Yeah. So uh, that's cool. Any advantages of using uh, DX versus FX? Let's see, DX versus FX. And well, so this has been a this That's has been a debate thing. for a long time, Steve. Talking about buying a, a, a APS-C camera and getting the uh, auto crop with an APS-C in long lenses, or just going to crop mode, right. DX mode in the uh, full frame camera. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? No, no, not, not not if you're talking about the same pixel pitch, pixel density on the sensor. No. Uh, you know, as far as like this question here, DX versus FX and cropping, it's exactly the same thing. If you go to your computer and crop to DX versus shooting at a DX, it's exactly the same thing. You're not changing anything. The okay. advantage of shooting DX in camera is if you know you're going to crop when you get back home, by shooting DX in camera, you're going to have, a, there's a few advantages. The first, you're not going to fill up your buffer as fast because you're sending smaller files to it. Uh your file sizes are going to be smaller, so they're easier to manage when you're back home, working on your computer, less storage to take up. On the Z9, any any mirrorless camera, I think, when you switch to a crop mode, instead of, like with our DSLRs, when we switched to crop mode, we'd get sometimes an overlay that would show where the DX area was, but we'd still have the rest of the frame that we were looking at. Right. With a mirrorless camera, it'll actually just fill the frame with that new right. crop, which is kind of nice, too. But... Uh, and in some cases, that could actually help with things like eye detection because it's bringing the, um, it's filling the frame better with the subject. So I've I, I've played with that a little bit. I was curious if it made a difference, and it did seem to. So okay. when I was messing with it, uh, I would go back and forth with this bird. I was going, you know, just testing. It's like, okay, let's try it. I can't find the eye. Can't find the eye. Go to DX, finds the eye. Go back to FX, can't find the eye. Go to DX, finds the eye. It's like, okay. So that, that's <laughs> it, does, it, it can help from that standpoint. So there are a couple advantages, but as far as an image quality advantages, there, there's no difference. So that's been a big point of contention in the forums, of course. People saying just go to DX crop mode on your full frame uh, camera mm -hmm. uh, rather than because you're, you're basically going to get the same thing. But I think one of the things they overlook is the fact that, just like you said, it fills the frame. If you're shooting long lenses, you have that, feeling that it it gives you more uh focal focal uh length but really not but really the not. other is the cost of the camera because everybody was really right. happy with the That's d500 the you know the d500 was is a fantastic camera and i think everybody's waiting to see something in uh mirrorless compete with the d500 dslr i think that would be a very good move for them yeah. because right now i mean we can shoot the Z9 and have you know great performance. We can go into crop mode, but basically then you're using a $5,500 DX camera, right. you know, whereas, you know, they could, you could get the same thing if maybe they, like you say, they have an equivalent camera for, you know, mirrorless, a, a, an equivalent Z camera that right. is a uh, DX crop. And it's, you know, maybe half the price or something like that, or, you know, 2000 bucks or something like that. That would be, you know, I think that would be a huge seller. But I do too. You gotta, you gotta be careful though, because it's you know, you're, uh, it's it, like you say, it looks like it's a longer focal length, but it's really just a you know that same lens cropped. 
yeah. versus the full frame. Yeah, so th there is a difference. You do you, you do lose some subject isolation, of course, when, so, uh, versus you know using a using it full frame and filling the frame the same way. So let me ask you a technical question on that. Are you really okay. getting just the sweet spot in the glass, or is it still using the full uh, focal? No, you're just getting the sweet spot. You're, you're getting with it. Yeah, that, that that middle sweet spot. But okay, many of the lenses are so well corrected now that it's not, in my opinion, it's not that big of a deal. If you know, I, I happily use lens, full frame lenses where I'm maybe having a vertical uh, orientation going on with a like a great blue heron or something like that, right. a long you know vertical bird. And even though he's out of the sweet spot of the lens, you know, his eye looks sharp. I can see the veins in it. It's like, you know, it's good enough for me. So edge to edge, the glass now is yeah, just the glass now is much better. Now there, I think there was a, you know, there wasn't, there was a time that maybe not too long ago where there was a, you know, you'd see some fall off on those edges and you still do. I mean, it's not, you know, the edges aren't going to be as sharp as the middle regardless, but yeah. you know, with these big primes for the most part, the edges I'm going to say are very usable though. You know, it, it's almost like, the edges are good enough and the middle's ridiculous. <laughs> well, thank you for answering that because I know a lot of people, this has been a big discussion. So appreciate what you found. I have a question for you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, but before that, Freeman wants to know, Steve, what are some of the budget friendly wildlife workshops you recommend? Oh, that's a good question. Cause I don't go, I, I have a couple, I do my own workshops, but I, I never look at anyone else's. <laughs> So I don't, I don't really have any, uh, I don't have an answer for that one. Uh, how about the second part here? <laughs> and how big of an advantage does Z system give us with TCs? Uh, that is a big advantage actually, because with DSLRs, we were limited to what we could do with TCs. Anytime you put a TC on, anytime you dropped, it wasn't so much putting a TC on just the fact that you were at five, six or smaller, you start to lose both AF abilities, like cross type AF points, become linear points. And in some cases you lose the AF point altogether. It's just not reliable anymore. So that's not as big of an issue or an issue at all, as far as I can tell with the, uh, with mirrorless cameras, not just a Z system, but any, any mirrorless camera. So you can shoot at much smaller apertures, wide open apertures, and still be able to autofocus all over the frame. Mm -hmm. However, keep in mind, you are still shooting at a smaller aperture. So a lot of times people say, oh, there's not a focus issue, but you have to look at the other issues that can come into play that now you're going to need, you know, more ISO for the same shutter speed, for instance, or you're going to lose subject isolation. If you have an animal that's kind of close to a background, you want that background blurry, but you're shooting F11 or F9 or something. Not, you know, that's not as good as shooting F4. You, right, know? So right. you, have, to, you have to kind of balance that out a little bit. What, uh, Suman asks, uh, Suman, you can't use a D5 with an 800 PF. No. You can't no, the 800 use. PF is uh, just for the Z mount. Yeah. So, all right. So my question to you is the top three mistakes photographers make uh, when out shooting, you see common mistakes. Okay. That's a good one. Let's see. I'm not I sure if I'm going to have a top three or just the first three that come to mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, number one is not trying to get to any kind of, proper elevation they're not trying to get to eye level they're just they're shooting down i see that a lot matter of fact i remember not too long ago a couple maybe man maybe it's a couple years back now we were in yellowstone and not only was this person not shooting at eye level they were standing on top of their truck shooting down almost straight down wow. on this coyote yeah it was not a, it was not a good look for the coyote i'm sure and uh so that's probably one of the big ones is it just makes such an impact when you're a little bit lower and at least at that animal's eye level. And sometimes even getting lower than eye level can really make it a, a very impactful photo. Uh, the second one has got to be not looking at backgrounds. People just, they, they walk up and they just shoot and they don't care what's behind it. And it's, it, it's a shame because there's so many times that just a small move, remember our lenses only see a few degrees. And just the smallest move can dramatically change the background. And people don't do it. I see it all the time, especially when animals are in trees. You know, one step over, and, you know, you have this beautiful solid green background, whereas where they were shooting, it's, you know, splotchy sky and you have all these white spots and it's backlit looks terrible. I was at Circle B Bar Reserve a few years back and there was an owl there and he was kind of hidden and then he kind of flew over a little bit and he came out to the open. Everybody who was you know waiting for him stood right where they were and his background was absolutely terrible, just miserable. So I walked over just probably 20 feet <laughs> and instantly I had this beautiful Spanish moss wonderful background behind him and i'm shooting away 
you know, because he'd look around back and forth. And when he'd look to me, I'd shoot. And they're getting this terrible, terrible photo that they're going to have to pull shadows and doing everything else. And, uh, and, and then they're, and they're missing, they're, they're missing the best shot. So that's the other one. And I'd say probably the third mistake would be people that are just, that they're, that they're not, they're not patient at the right times. They're not, they, they don't judge their subject real well. So, you know, I see people that make mistakes both ways. Sometimes they'll stick with a bad subject for too long. I have a friend who tell uh, Dennis uh, is one of our uh, guides down in Costa Rica. And one of the things he noticed, it's a, I love this saying, he says, he says, you know, it takes longer to take a bad photo than a good photo. <laughs> because if you get a bad photo, people will work it and work it and work it because they keep looking at the camera and they're not getting the result they want. When it's a, when it's a good photo though, and the animal's in a good spot and everything's working right, everything looks great. They, yeah, they shoot it and they're like, oh, look how good this looks, you know, and then they're done. So, but I think that's one of the bigger mistakes is people, they, they, they're not picking good subjects or when they're on a good subject, they're leaving it too soon. So I see both of those things happening. And I think that, and that, you know, I think that's something that is developed over time. You kind of learn, you know, what a lost cause looks like versus something that's worth staying with. But so many times I see something, you know, rather extraordinary. It's like, oh, wow, this is really good. And you're wondering why, you know, and, and you know, maybe you're worth a workshop or something. They're like, okay, let's go. It's like, well, this is really good. We should stay, <laughs> you know, but you know, and, and you see people do that or, or they'll stick with an, I say, you see the opposite too. They'll stick with a lost cause. It's like, okay, you know, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. The sun's awful here. This animal is up under some sticks and leaves and stuff. And it's like, he's going to sit there all day. There's no point in sticking around. So I think that's the other thing is either leaving an animal too soon. That's really good. Or trying to stick with an animal and make a shot there. That's just not going to work. So those yeah, are those are I guess the first three that come to mind. Great advice, though. Great advice. That is. Uh, I say I have yeah. a whole bunch of other ones that just came to mind too. But <laughs> <laughs> but one tip tip for patience because I when I go out and I try my hand in birds, mm -hmm. I'm like I don't have patience. You know I'm there. Okay, you're not nothing's going on here. Let's go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It takes it takes patience. Sometimes it's worth camping with an animal, and like I say, sometimes it's not. It's very difficult, but th 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 it's a pretty big mistake though, when you, when you, when you make the wrong move. So it's uh, because you, you end up, if you're with a bad animal, that's never going to get good. You're missing potential great shots someplace else. Right. But if you, you know, but you know, at the same time, you don't want to move off of a good animal and, you know, have some, you know, I remember one morning I was camping out with a, with a black bear in the smoky. She had some cubs up in the tree and they were just kind of milling around and I'm sitting there and I'm just, you know, waiting. Cause I knew when she woke up, we were going to have some stretching and there was going to be some, you know, there's going to be some shots. So this was one of those situations where people were coming, they'd say, oh, she's just sleeping. And then they left. It's like, oh, no, she's something's going to, if you stick with a bear long enough, something good's going to happen. That's the rule. And she was out in, she was in a decent enough spot that once she got up, you, you, she was going to be very visible. And sure enough, it really paid off. And, you know, I've sold some prints from that, you know, from that day. And she got up and she was stretching and she was sitting and she really looked, you know, it was, it was really, it was really worth the wait. So I say it's, but, well, uh, yeah. Patience, isn't patience a virtue itself. when it comes to wildlife though? What's that? Isn't patience a virtue when it comes to wildlife? Too many people just want to go snap, snap, and and, and they're gone. It is. It is. It, it pays to it pays to work a good subject. It pays to work a good subject. But I think, like I say, I think the opposite's true too. Though, if it's completely a lost cause, it doesn't pay to stick around and work a, a subject. If you have, mm -hmm. for example, uh, let's say you find a coyote, you're out in Yellowstone driving around, you see a coyote, and he's at 100 yards. He's too far. You're like, okay, well, what about I'm going to get out and I'm going to see if I can get closer. And he maintains that 100 yard distance. You can spend all day with him, but if he keeps, but if he's going to maintain that distance, he's not going to let you approach. You're never going to get the shot. Right. What else could you have shot that day? So there is a balance. No matter how patient you are, that coyote maybe is never going to come near you. But on the other hand, if you find one that's a little more receptive, then yeah, he's worth hanging out with for as long as he'll let you. Yeah. So I say it's, you have to really, it's a lot of it comes down to judging the animal's personality and, you know, what their location is, you know, and, you know, what, what the light's doing and what the conditions are and but, you know, something could come together. You always have to, you know, you have to be playing the what if game. But right? what if, uh, I mean, what if, um, I'm sure, has there ever been a day where you just went out and you did nothing? Like, oh, how, yeah. Oh, yeah. how does that, how does that make you feel? Does that make, oh no, it's, you... it's always discouraging. It's always yeah. discouraging. Uh, you know, there's been days, I remember there was one trip to Yellowstone. 
I was there three or four nights. I was supposed to be there longer. I actually I left early because I was so discouraged. I was like, after about three or four days of, I got exactly one shot that was decent. And other than that, it was just bison and at a distance, no less, you know, you couldn't find coyotes. Nothing was around. It was just, you know, it was just kind of bad. And, you know, sure. You get discouraged and you go, you know what, I'm just, you know, I'm going to move on though. So I went to, I think, I think I went back uh, over to Custer or something and actually had a really good several days there getting all sorts of great shots. So, you know, no one to walk away from a, from a bad situation, even in Yellowstone. Yeah. yeah it, just... it, can, it can get, it can get discouraging. We've spent, you know, all day long, 12, 14 hours driving around and never bothered to get the camera out. And then there's, but there's other days though, where your hand is tired of holding it and you're cramped you know, because you're shooting so much. Yeah. So yeah. it just depends on, you know, but it's all part of it. It's all, you know, if it were easy, you know, we'd all go out, find a nice Fox or something and take his picture and go yeah. home and have these, you know, amazing images. Well, it would, it would, you know, if you want to do that, you know, they they have these things called zoos, but, uh, you know, there's a saying though, the rise will sun the next day. The rise will, you know, the sun, the sun will, will rise, rise yep. the next day. So yeah, you know, yeah. collect your thoughts and regroup and uh, that's how you have to do it. <laughs> you, have to, you have to go out because every day is different. And, you know, if it's, you know, you, you can have a slow day followed up by a day that's absolutely hopping and it just, it goes back and forth. You just never know. And you don't go, you, you don't get anything if you stay in bed though. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, okay. This comment, the man, you know, when you hear comments like this, you know, it's just, you know, when somebody throws me a compliment, it's just like, you know, I'm sure you've been getting this over the years and you've helped out so many in the community and you are the man in this industry. I mean, in this genre of photography, um, it just makes me, it, it humbles me to, to the point where, okay, I'm glad I'm helping people out, you know? Yeah, so I just, I thought, I thought I'd point that out where you, you you know these comments that are like so uh uplifting and mo they motivational are, you know yeah i i they i think you said it best it, it, they, they are very humbling you just you know you you're doing your you know i'm not, I, I do my best i try to give the best advice i can and try to be you know completely honest with everybody all the time and just tell you what i think but uh you know it just th th those comments do, do do mean a lot and they are very humbling and you know, all I can say is thank you. I don't, you know, I, 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 I get very awkward when people are complimenting me. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, I just, but I do appreciate, I really do appreciate it though. It's very, very kind of them to say so. Yeah. I, sometimes I don't know how to respond. Like, thank you, man. Yeah. yeah. That's, all, that, that's all I do is just, you know, thank you so much. I, I wonder like, is that enough? Was that short? I know it always feels inadequate. It's like, wow. You know, especially sometimes people will, you know, give you a whole paragraph or two, like, Wow, thank you. I just, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know what to say. You know, it's it, it's like it's super nice of you guys. You really make my day. But uh, it's like I just, like you say, it's very hard sometimes to, you know, to you, you know, say, like you say, I think the best thing is that it's very humbling and it just kind of makes you sit back and go, wow. Hey, uh, Chuck. Yeah, I have a question for Steve. But real quickly, guys. Uh, again, guys, thank you on the chat for all the questions. Uh, real, real quick plug. Uh, Vahography talk Tuesday. 10 a.m. next week we got jerry guionis on so join us then hit the like button guys it helps out a lot if you really enjoy this podcast so steve yeah as far as the z9 birds in flight what are your af settings to go to oh for let's see on that one there's a bunch of them <laughs> <laughs> uh for autofocus obviously afc we'll start with the easy one and usually i like one of the wide af areas but I sometimes use it in conjunction with 3D. So I'll tell you how that works. So a lot of times I like to pick up the subject with either wide, small, wide, large. I'll favor, I like to use the smallest AF area I can. I actually don't use, I know they have the custom C1, C2, and I've played with them. But so far, I just, I still like wide, large, and small. Those two, those seem to work better for me. Um, but I tend to pick them up with that. Sometimes I'll just leave it on those and I'll, and I'll shoot. But... I also kind of use it in conjunction with 3D. I have both my FN1 and FN3 buttons set for 3D. FN3 set that way because I can't really reach it because my hands are too small. So when I'm shooting vertical and my middle finger is looking for 3D, it knows where it is. So it hits FN3. But anyhow, so I'll pick it up with wide. And if I see that subject detection is like on the eye real well or on the face real well, I'll press the 3D button, the FN1 button, and switch to 3D right there on the spot. So that way I don't have to necessarily keep the bird within that wide AF area and I can compose it however I want on the fly. 
or more embarrassingly, if I'm not keeping, you know, the bird in the frame real well and I need the camera to help me a little more, uh, 3D comes to the rescue there. But that's usually my approach. One of the things I have found, and you do have to be care a little bit more careful with the uh, custom setting A3 on the Z9, the uh, focus tracking with lock on. I found that for birds in flight, if you have a busy background behind the bird, that the camera likes to kind of try to jump to that sometimes. And I find putting that focus tracking lock on to a setting of five rather than my normal three is usually a good way to go. Sometimes four works too there. But, uh, you know, if you find the camera is kind of jumping off the bird and not sticking with it, just increase that delay. And use a focus limiter too. That helps too. If the camera's kind of hunting for the bird, the focus limiter makes it go a lot faster. So, you know, those are kind of the, the main settings there. The other one I would caution you on is subject detection. And sometimes you want that off, sometimes you want it on. With a more traditional looking bird, like an osprey or an eagle or something like that, subject detection does a decent job, an okay job of finding those faces and eyes while the bird's in flight. As long as the bird's filling the frame enough and that you're staying on it really well, you know, if the bird's all over the place or the bird's too small, it's not going to find it. But, you know, if you have it decently filling the frame and you're staying on the bird pretty well, subject detection on those more traditional looking birds works pretty well. But on like something like a long neck bird, where you have a very, uh, the caliber of the head is almost the same as the neck, like an Inhinga or something like that. I find that a lot of times during the panning, the camera can't really keep up with finding the face in the eye. It seems like it's, it's not, uh, at least with the current software, it's not keeping up real well. So it says, hey, I don't see the face or eye, but I see the body. So it'll go for the body. Unfortunately, the body is not where I want that autofocus point if that bird is anything but completely parallel to me. So if the bird's coming at an angle and it goes for the body, I have I have 100% failure rate with soft faces and soft eyes. <laughs> so sometimes you need to shut that off and just use the uh, like wide, small AF area. And it can, acts a little bit like the old group AF area. Not quite, but it, it, it's very similar to that. It usually tries to focus close focus priority, but... When it says close focus priority, what it really is, what, what what those instructions really mean when you read stuff like that, is that it's going to focus on the closest point of good contrast that it can. Not necessarily the closest thing, but the first thing that it can find that it can focus on. Because sometimes you'll find, a, you know, if you have a bird coming straight at you, sometimes it wants to grab those wings and shoulders rather than the face because the face is so small. So, you know, sometimes that's not, you know, as ideal as we'd like it to be. But uh, there, there's no system that's perfect either. Yeah. But uh, yeah, those are kind of, you know, my ballpark settings. Sometimes I'll use dynamic, uh, not as often though. It seems like the, like I say, I've, I've been kind of favoring like the wide, small and the wide, large areas. Though, so cool. I think that covers all of them. That's yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, usually 3200 of a second. I like to remember, try to remember to shut VR off, things like that. But uh, yeah, I think that's, that's probably it. We have a question, Dave Thomas, uh, Thompson. Do you have a rule of thumbs, lens, length to distance to subject ratio to use? Not really, no. Because uh, I can't calculate that stuff out in the uh, out in the field. If somebody asks me what twenty feet looks like, I'll give you a, you know a bunch of different answers. I don't really, I'm not very good at distance at all. Um, so I don't really use any kind of, you know, I'm not looking at something saying, oh, this subject is fifty yards away, so I need this lens. Yeah, you, know, you just over time you just kind of look at something and you say, oh yeah, I need a six hundred for that or a five hundred for that or whatever. But it's not just the subject. The other thing that you have to consider is how much background are you including, and or how crop mm -hmm. or, or how tight are you going to crop that subject. Sometimes the better shot is the headshot, and sometimes the better shot is the environmental shot. And sometimes, you know, you just want the field guide shot where it's just the animal standing. Yeah. I don't usually want that shot, but some people do. Yeah. But you have to look at all of those different factors and say, okay, what do I want to include? Not with just the animal, but the surrounding area as well. You know, do I want to have the animal a little bit smaller in the frame and show more of this background? Maybe there's a mountain or some, maybe there's just some nice meadow behind him. So you really, you have to consider all of those things when you're deciding on a focal length. That's where zoom lenses come in handy. <laughs> So, uh, Scott, hi, Steve. With the advent of AI software for noise reduction, has your system for treating noise in photos changed since your, you've published your tutorials? Uh, a little bit. I still use the method in those tutorials, but I also am using uh, Topaz Denoise AI a lot more. I use On One No Noise as well and playing with DxO. I, I, I find that not every – I find that there's not one single – 
program that does everything. So a lot of times I'll try it with Topaz. And if I don't like the results, it has like four different methods. If I don't like any of those, I'll look at uh, on one, no noise. And I might try DXO and, or I might use my Lightroom and uh, Photoshop method too. Sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes just the camera raw type method where you just go in with that Adobe's noise reductions are a real blunt instrument, but sometimes that's, sometimes that's exactly what you need. So yeah, it, it, it varies. But in reference to that tutorial, in that tutorial, I talk about using different layers and stuff to for different levels of noise reduction. And I'll do that sometimes, but just using like Topaz or something like that. So one of these days I might actually update that tutorial and include some of that new, newer information once I get maybe a more, uh, I guess, pin down workflow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Richard asks, and this is a good question. I want to know: Do you turn VR off using 800 millimeter PF with a tripod? It depends. Yeah. If the shutter speed is really low, because anytime I'm on a tripod, I'm, I have a loose gimbal. I, I'm, I'm not locking the gimbal down, so it's always a loose lens. It's always a loose lens. So if I am at say, if I remember, <laughs> just shut it off. If I am at shutter speeds where I don't think I need VR, say thousand sixteen hundredth of a second. I'll shut it off if I remember to do it. And just to be on the safe side, sometimes VR can introduce a little bit of softness. I've not seen a lot of that with the 800 PF, but you know, it can't, it, you know, it, it, the possibility is there. I think it's better to shut it off if you don't need it. But if I am, you know, say 500th of a second and I'm on a tripod, sure, I'll have it on. And because again, I'm on a loose gimbal and Nikon's newest VR technology, especially the stuff in like an 800 PF and in the Z9, it can detect when the rig is on a tripod. So it's not going to accidentally kind of try to move the image around when it doesn't need to. So it's not really a big deal. So I've not, I've not had any problem with that. You shoot stills. Do you do any video at all when you're out? Uh, no, my wife does a little bit of video, but oh, nice. uh, no, I don't do any video. Unfortunately, I just... Because every time I've tried to do video when I'm out, the animal does something where I wanted that as a photo. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. like a little switch, like, oh, I'm going to do a video of this. And then the animal does some extraordinary thing I've been waiting for. I'm like, oh. yeah. Hey, Ronald, a question for Mr. Perry. If you had to rate the AF performance on scale of 1 to 10, where would you rate it in your experience? I think he's talking about the Z9. Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know, an 8 or a 9, and I'd say the A1 is like a 9 or a 10. So like I say, very close. I think that's a good way to rate it just because it, it lets me kind of <laughs> talk about exactly, you know, what the, uh, uh, the performance difference really is close. Yeah. Hey, Bayou Josh in the house. What's up, man? Uh, trip of a lifetime. He asks, and which system are you bringing? Oh, Can a Sony Nikon? That's a good question. A lot of the trips that I take are for a lot of people, they do consider them like a trip of a lifetime. And like I say, you know, it just, it, it, in a lot of cases, it would depend on what I was working on. If I'm working on a book for the Z9, I'd be probably thinking about taking that outfit. If I'm doing something with the Sony stuff, I'd probably do that. But if we take all of those restraints off and say, you're not working on a project, you're just going out. Because I know that's what he's asking. <laughs> if you're just going out and I could pick anything. Uh, right now, I would probably still uh, favor the Sony. All right. By just a hair. Just but I just I like the custom I like the customization better, and I like the uh, uh, I say that for bird and flight stuff it is slightly better, and uh, you know it is a little bit smaller, lighter outfit too. So all of those things considered, yeah, I'd probably favor that. But I do want to throw this in. Again, it's not just the camera; it's the whole system. So if Nikon were to come out with a six hundred, and if that's especially if that six hundred happened to have a teleconverter in it. At that point, I think my yeah. uh, my answer would change because I'm uh, you know I'm looking at the whole system and it's like that one thing would be enough to make me go okay wait a minute here how many shots am I going to miss because I'm messing with teleconverters and it would also depend on the trip and what I was doing and things like that but uh, I think right now Sony by Sony by a nose yeah by a nose <laughs> that's I mean yeah I mean like I said man they're all great even the Canons you know so. Mm -hmm um chuck you're quiet you're awfully quiet today so i'm trying to take care of the chat over here and help uh, out in that regard hey be free tv he, he said uh everyone else <clears throat> i'm sorry steve's talking everyone's listening and, and you're absolutely right be free that's exactly what we're doing we're letting steve talk thank you very much for the comment yes thank you <laughs> uh chuck i want to Open up the phone lines, man. Let's see if uh, we have a phone call for 
Mr. Steve Perry. While he's doing that, I got a question for oh, you. Oh, cool. Man. Yeah. Do you, do you? I mean, I'm sure you get this a lot. Steve Perry, the 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 singer. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You like Journey? Yeah, they're all right. I I, I wish I liked him more. I guess you know since uh, since you know he's named after me. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's great. I like that. That's a good uh, one, man. <laughs> He, I don't think he could sing anymore. I think his voice. Is oh, I, I well, he, he, I can't sing at all. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> More like him every day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let exactly. Me, let me put. Yeah, it I tell to, people you'll pay me to stop singing. There's a number, guys. If you want to uh -oh. call in and talk to Steve live, let's see if we get a phone call. Uh, Steve, what's in your bag when you go out? Depends, right? But I mean, it really money. does. It depends. It depends. Uh, right people now. Lenses. I'm going. Let's do this. I'm going to Costa Rica in a few weeks or a couple weeks. Oh gosh, less than two weeks, geez. Um, and for Costa Rica, I'm going to take. We're going to have a Sony and a Nikon kit. For the Nikon kit, it's going to be. I'm trying to think. Uh, for sure, the 600 f4 teleconverter. I like that. I'm going to leave the 800 pf at home because I don't use 800. I use it a lot down there, but I use 600 quite a bit too. Probably a little bit more. So I'm going to take the 600 this time. And I think I'm going to take the uh, 100 to 400. And definitely the macro lens, a new macro lens, a new Nikon 105. Ooh, sweet lens. And uh, that might be it. I might squeeze in a 500 PF if I can find space for it, but I'm not married to that idea. Most of uh, what I do in Costa Rica, I can do with a 600 F4. So what, what, what's probably your gonna be my main lens, down, main lens what, down there. What's Hello? your gimbal of choice? Uh, Wimberly, WH200. I've had them for Hello. years. Who, who do we have on the phone? John Weir. Hey, John Weir. Hi, John. Nice to meet you, sir. Oh. You have a question or a comment? Yeah, my Steve? question. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Steve or anybody. <laughs> hey, Steve. Uh, I've read all your books. Awesome. And, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I've read all your books. My question is when I put a teleconverter on, when I, when I, Put a telecon. There we go. Teleconverter on my PF five hundred or on the one hundred to four hundred seems to slow down the speed of autofocus. Not the autofocus. If I'm looking. Really. Hey, hey, if I look at a still bird, everything's great. It's when I try and look at a flying thing, things go into the can pretty fast i don't like it but uh hmm that's interesting yeah i because i have checked like af speeds before what do you think yeah i've checked I, i've checked af speeds before with like i, I haven't checked it with the 100 400 teleconverter versus not but i've checked it with the 500 pf with and without the teleconverter and the af speed itself is i mean right right there it is uh Within a fraction of a second, within like a, I think a, thirtieth or a fifteenth of a second, so I mean basically imperceptible. Yeah, well, that's really strange. Yeah, I'm not. Which camera again? Yeah, that's probably a nut behind the wheel problem. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I have trouble finding the bird in the sky on a bright sky. Okay. Hey, John. All right, thanks for calling, man. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, he said he had a hard time finding the bird in the bright sky. And yeah, yep, the, I'm here. Okay, yeah. yeah John, what are the what are the feed uh, down I have, behind you there? It's, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit involved, but I have a video of I think it's called Finding Your Subject with a Long Lens. That'll show you exactly how to do that to fix that. All right, thanks for calling. Nice question. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean that it only makes sense. So. I'll I'll check it out. I read all of your stuff. So all right. thank you so much. Thank you. All right, let's take a couple of more calls, and then once the question is in, Chuck, if you could just mute their audio, can you do that? No, not really. But what I'd like to say is, please, if you call in, turn the feed off in the background. You're going to hear that echo, and it's hard for Steve to hear your question and answer your question. You'll hear him over your phone. So just mute the audio in the background, and you'll be good to go. 
So uh, let's see. So what what do you like to do for fun, Steve? Like other than photography, what do you, what do you like to do? Is there something besides photography? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's fun. I mean, other than that, I mean, uh, okay. you have any other? Lately, it's been pretty much all I've been doing. Uh, it's been a busy year, but yeah. uh, no, we uh, sometimes go out kayaking, bike riding, things like that. So staying it's, active uh, when I get the chance. I like to do that. I haven't been kayaking for a little while, but uh, uh, sounds like a good idea. It's nice and warm out. Be a good day for it. Any 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 hobbies that you're into that people don't know, or or something that do, people don't know about you that you want to share? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, I I say probably about the only thing that would be even remotely considered a hobby would be just uh, I say do some kayaking. You know, almost everything I do kind of wraps around photography, even camping. You know, we go out camping and we don't do it to uh, go out camping. We go out because we're going to Yellowstone or something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. This, what kind of music you like? Uh, all kinds. I, I've been mostly listening to uh, more modern pop lately. Oh, okay. Sometimes country. Just depends. It depends on the mood. Depends on the mood. That's cool. <laughs> Are you a rock and roller? Uh yeah. <laughs> I, I can like some of it, sure. Yeah, it depends. It depends. Cool, man. Uh, Chuck. Yes, sir. We got a caller, or can we move on to rapid fire now? We have no caller. All right. Let's Everyone's do this. afraid to call now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have. We're gonna ask you some rapid fire questions. Okay. I like to do this towards the end of the podcast, but. Um, Real quickly, guys, it's my pleasure holding these podcasts. It's very informative and people appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah, man, tune in every week. So my first question to you is f- your favorite lens of all time. Uh, favorite lens, 500 PF. All time. Yep. It's not, it's not the one I use all the time, but I have more fun shooting with that one than any other. Lens. It's just a fun lens to use. Ah, nice, nice. Nikon 500 PF. It is a lot of fun. I really like using it. Like I say, it's not the one I use all the time. My bread and butter lens is a 600 F4. And uh, I could pick the Sony or the Nikon. I like them both. But uh, those are the lenses I use probably 60, 70% of the time. But my favorite lens to use, definitely the 500 PF. It's small. It's lightweight. It's versatile. It lets me get into places that I normally can't poke into. It just It's easy to take along. No, I, I, I have a good time with that one. What's on your okay next? One, what's on your bucket list? What do you haven't shot yet? Animal or that you uh, really probably uh, we keep talking about Antarctica. Get down there, do some penguins. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We were we 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 were we were thinking about that one. We were actually scheduled to go a couple of years ago. Then COVID hit and the boat was repossessed. So <laughs> we we're supposed to go on or something like that. I don't know, but yeah. We, so so we didn't go. Your situation of shot like let's say for example the eagle grabbing the fish or something to do with the animal doing some type of Mm -hmm. thing yeah what's on your bucket list as far as that the situation oh i would love to capture oh my gosh i have so many that's a hard question to answer um i would love to capture a cheetah or a lion or something like that leaping in midair and just about to make contact with some kind of antelope or something like that. That would be, that would be up there. Uh, any kind of leaping animal though is always fun. Uh, but some kind of a, uh, some kind of a, just before it happens, kind of a, uh, j- just before the kill or something type of shot. That's definitely high on the list. Ah, uh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I, I say I could probably sit here and dream up about 50. Although most wildlife photographers can, well, I'd like to do this one and this one and this one. Or so, your favorite lens is the 500 pf right so if you if you had to just if you had to take just one lens with you would it be that one or would it be another lens no it'd be the 600 f4 like i say i use the six the 600 f4 is the bread and butter lens the 500 pf is the one i like to play with i like to have fun with but uh the 600 f4 really that, that's the one i've been using 600 f4s for years now and they just i, I mean that is when it comes to the one lens that you need or that i like to use anyway for wildlife that's the one that's that, that, that gets me the shots and gets me the right range and it takes that 1.4 tc really well so yeah you I see? Miss the 500 but i take the six you see chuck the 500 uh, the 600 fl baby yeah yeah, yeah. 
if I could afford it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they're 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 pricey. They're pricey. Yeah, the, I bought one for a really good price, Steve. And Did you? I had, I had to jump on it. Yeah, it's like fifty eight hundred. They won't disappoint. They 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 are they are just absolutely incredible. Fifty eight hundred dollars U.S. mint. Wow, those heft mounts are really getting down there. No, 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 no. I I got lucky. Okay, they're still going for a nine, eight, nine. Oh, good, eight, good, because yeah, 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 yeah. No, nine, eventually nine. I got to sell mine and get that other that when Nikon ever, yeah, you know, whenever they release that other six hundred, I'm gonna want to sell mine and get that uh, get the new one. So, do you? I mean, okay, this is an easy one. I I know the answer, but okay, DSLR or mirrorless? I've all but given up on DSLRs at this point. Okay. Pretty much, you don't shoot at all mirrorless. DSLR. Yeah. No more. Not that there's anything wrong with them. I don't want because people hear me say stuff like that and they go, "Steve hates DSLRs." No, he doesn't. He likes DSLRs. I think the D850 and the D500, for example, are a couple of the best DSLRs ever made by anyone. But uh, I also think that uh, the D850 and the what? Coming in anachronism. The D850 and the what? Uh, 500. D500. D500. Okay. What, what? I think those are two of the best DSLRs ever made. Yeah, funny. Those but, are the two DSLRs I have left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're they're great cameras. It's just, um, and they're still very capable. I just. I've really kind of become addicted to the features of mirrorless cameras. You know, you have the live histograms and blinkies and things like that, and the faster frame rates and autofocus all over the AF, air, all over the viewfinder is really what. Uh, You're in good company. What, what seals the deal for me? You're in good company. We asked, um, um, oh, shoot, uh, who was our big guest? Asked him about film and uh, DSLRs, and he said, oh, no, I don't want to go back to that. He enjoyed it while he had it, but mm -hmm. he was enjoying the mirrorless revolution. Joe McNally. Joe McNally. And, yeah. you know, so you're in good company, man. That is good. No, I like Joe. Yeah. I, I've, never, I've never had the pleasure, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I've, always, I've always looked up to him. He's, he, he is absolutely phenomenal. He you is know what one I would of the best love? flash photographers, like, in the history I, I, of the world, I think. He's just – he's really yeah. good, but uh, – yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember shooting film, and people asked me that when I was shooting DSLRs. They're like, "Hey, would you ever go back to film?" I was like, "No, no." <laughs> and then, that, and this is the same thing. This isn't quite as as extreme. Uh, this isn't quite as um, adamant of a no, but it's, right. it's 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 still a no. But no, I once you get used to the mirrorless stuff, plus everything's moving that way. And for the stuff that I do as far as educational stuff and trying to keep current with everything and showing people what's new it just you know there's nothing new happening in the dslr world so yep. I, again i, I want to emphasize not that ever, everyone needs to hear that and run out and buy a mirrorless camera mirrorless cameras are still very bleeding edge technology at this point in my opinion but uh um <laughs> and dslrs are still very capable but uh yeah i'm i'm in the mirrorless camp hero uh, if anyone doesn't want to send <laughs> to me hey you know what uh i still use Mirror, I mean, I he has my DSLRs. I just bought a D3X. How do you feel about the uh, the the professional Nikon series? Uh, what was which one was your favorite? The four, the five, the six? Oh my D3? gosh, I like them all. I had a D3, a D3X. I had a pair of D3Xs at one point. Nice. Uh, I had a D4. I did not have the D4S. I had the D5 and the D6. Uh I feel like I should say D6, but I didn't get. A, I didn't have a lot of time with that one because very yeah. shortly after. The D6 came out, the A92 came was out, and then the A1 came out. And I just kind of was transitioning to mirrorless, so I didn't take as many shots with the D6 as I would have liked. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say the D5, just because I have a nice history with that camera. I think we've shot 150, 200,000 images together, something like that, and I've had I had a lot of good times. It was it, it really was a fantastic performer and never any problems. But that I, that can be said with all the pro Nikon bodies. I've never I'm trying to think, I don't think I've ever had a problem with any Pro Nikon body except for the D3X, and that's because I wore out the mount. Yeah, <laughs> changing lenses too much. I had to send it to Nikon, and they're like, "Yeah, you wore this out. We have to replace." It. Wow. So, you know, I had a D4 and a D5, and I, I bought, I bought the, I sold the D4, got the D5. And they, that, that camera never really got a lot of love. I mean, there was a little bit of hatred even in the beginning because of the uh the iso range on it and everybody just you know oh uh, that's right yeah they yeah they, but you know what i'm with you i love the d5 i wish i hadn't sold it now well but, yeah no i really i really enjoyed that camera and the d6 i mean i probably if i had the d6 longer i would have kind of ended up favoring that one 
I usually like the new I usually like the new toys better than the old toys, but the truth is the D6, I mean, the D6 was great and it was really a better camera than the D5. And a lot of people would argue it's a D5S. I think it kind of just made that D6 uh, designation there, but uh, right. I don't know. I just, uh, I just have such a history of the D5. I, I just, uh, I got to say that one's my favorite. And maybe that's it too. Maybe there's just some nostalgic love there for the D5. I don't know, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it though. I thought it was a great camera. I won't Me too. Me drag too. this out anymore. <laughs> Charles says, what's your favorite animal? shoot oh i sound like a five-year-old in kindergarten but a lion mm. i do like yep. lions they just I, I like the uh they are super interesting they, yeah. they there's so much interaction with the lions between you know it's different social things between the the, the different uh animals in each pride and in between prides and uh this the, the hierarchy and uh it just they, they're, they're super interesting animals and I just, uh, like I say, I, I know I sound like a kindergartner, kindergartner saying, hey, yeah, well, I like lions, but I really do. They're, 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 uh, they're definitely my favorite. Uh, anytime we're in Africa, I never, I never get tired of taking their photos. They're always impressive. It's just, you haven't, you haven't lived until you've looked straight down the nose of a lion and wow. he's looking you right in the eye. At that point, you either fall in love or you have a heart attack. I don't know. <laughs> what about, what about tigers? I've not photographed tigers. They could take that. They could take that number one spot. There you go, right? Those I eyes mean, and those. Scary. Yeah, they're they're even more intense. They're even more yeah. intense. They're bigger, stronger, faster. I wouldn't. Yeah, they're uh, they're something. But you know, some of the things I've seen lions do. I saw one. It wasn't dragging it much, but it was dragging a hippo <laughs> <laughs> by himself. He was moving it. He was inching it. But just to, you know, this is you know an adult hippo, and this lion's just like you know yanking on it with his jaw, and it's like. Every time you see them, they're just so impressive. How much How strength is there? Wow. How often have you been to Africa, East Africa, Ronald? Uh, we've been there, I think, a total of five times. Mm. The last one was for a month. Sometimes we're there longer than others. Question for you, man. If yeah. I were to take that trip, how much would it cost someone just to go take that trip and out-of-pocket expense flight? A, a rough figure. Just a rough rough number. Um, From the U.S.? It, most of the most safaris are in the eight to twelve thousand dollar range. Mm -hmm. Now I was there for a long time, but I was comped because I was bringing groups, so I didn't. Of course, you know, I was yeah. making money, not spending it. <laughs> but um, you, you know, if you were going there for an average safari of say ten days or so, usually there, usually figure about a thousand bucks a day. And then mm -hmm. flights, it just depends on your comfort level. If you want to go up front and go in first class, I. Those seats can go for upwards of ten to twelve thousand dollars each, mm -hmm. and uh, we did see some like uh, coach fares though. I think my wife found one for like around a thousand twelve hundred bucks round trip. You mean you're not you're not taking that sweet? You've seen those flights with the sweet and luxury, super luxury with the bed. So some of them have cubicles, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, man. Uh, I, I, I look at those prices. Now, if I can get a discount, I have I have been able to fly first a couple of times because we had some kind of discount or upgrade, things like that. Sometimes they sneak in and you can do that and it's not nearly as expensive. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. But when I'm starting to look at when, you know, my wife and I go, we go together when we're running these things and it's like, OK, we can spend twenty thousand dollars on seats or we could buy a new lens. <laughs> yeah. Or two. So, you know, it just uh, it just it's insane. I But, you know, they uh, they, they fill them up. You know, I just, just, rem I'm just thinking about the the pick, your choice for favorite lens of all time, and how that what that means about Nikon, what that says about Nikon, because you're probably one of the greatest at what you do, well, and thank you. choosing Nikon just says a lot about that company, and uh, you know everybody appreciates you over here, so uh, including me and Chuck. Well, thank you guys. Um, a couple, a couple more. Uh, Real quick, have you ever been in danger of your life doing these things? Because it could be dangerous, right? Yeah, it can. Uh, I've been charged by bears. Wow! I charged him right back. It worked. Um, it was a it was an adolescent black bear. He was uh, trying to. He, we, we we had been photographing him for a while, and he just kind of turned and ran towards three of us. And the other two photographers went like that. I just, I, I stood there and I leaned forward and clapped a few times and he stopped and glared at me and kind of walked away and 
glared at me as he was walking away. Wow. But uh, I don't think it was a mock charge. I don't think I was in any actual danger. But uh, yeah, we've had uh, uh, there was a workshop last year where we had a hippo uh, kind of think about he was he came close to, uh, to jump. He wanted he kind of came right at the boat and uh, we were very close there. And I was I mean, I was at the point where I told the groups like sit down right now. I was where he's going to dump us. But uh, the engine was off at the moment. So that's not, a, you know, it's one, if, if a hippo charges your boat and your engine's running, you're not real worried about it. But when the engine's not running, that yeah. gets pretty dangerous. Uh, we've had lions like right next to the vehicles. And sometimes, you know, they get a little bit more curious than you'd like them to be. But uh, I've never really felt like I was in any real big danger there. But uh, probably I'm trying to think if there's anything that's, just, I don't think I've ever felt like I was in like any kind of like real, real bad danger. But I'm also try to stay very aware of what's going on. Like we were walking back to uh, our tent uh, just a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in Africa. And uh, we were in the Okavanga Delta. We're walking back towards our tent middle of the day. There's a Buffalo. Now when a Buffalo sees you, he likes to charge. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's like one of those things. It's like, you know, but I'm looking way ahead and we saw him way before he saw us. So we, you know, just backed out and went, you know, took a different route, you know, and uh, you, you know, when he wandered off, we were fine. But, it's one of those things. I think some of it, a lot of it is awareness when you're around these more dangerous animals, what you can and can't get away with. And uh, just trying to stay, you know, safe from that perspective. You know, we've seen people do just absolutely stupid things with bears. Uh, we were in the Smokies once. Here's a good, here, here's a good, this will make you do this. Um, we had some cubs up a tree and mom was underneath the tree in Cades Cove. They're, the mother are these bears are really used to people. I wasn't really concerned. I'm not on top of them again using those long lenses. So I'm sitting there photographing, and mom decides to cross the road. And I said, Nope. So we, and my daughter was with me on this trip. So we moved down the road. Unfortunately, the bear and the cub barrier was between us and our vehicle. So we were way up, we were probably 50, 100 yards. It wasn't a shot anymore. I'm just watching and waiting to get my chance to get back to the car. And uh, slowly but surely, people start gathering under the tree with the cubs with the mom directly behind him. No okay. one's looking at the cubs or no one's looking at the mom there. She's, and it's not like she was hidden. It was very obvious. There was a bear there. She's like in the, she was in the grass, but she was, you know, shoulders, you know, and back row. I mean, it was very obvious and people would look and they're like, Oh, we shouldn't do this. And they kept going. And the more people that did it, the more people that continued to do it, it kind of grew and grew. And finally a ranger came and uh, you don't usually hear him swear, but he was swearing at him that day. And uh, he's like, there's a, mother bear there and you guys are standing between her cubs what kind of dumb wow. is? i mean he was just going off on them and uh you know everyone scattered but uh you know it's just like i say it's it's not it's not doing stuff like that that keeps you safe you have to you know kind of people sometimes get so caught up in the photography or seeing the animal that they kind of check their brain at the door and that's where you get i think that's where you get the problems i think as long as you are relatively aware of what's going on and you're not trying to push or pursue an animal. You know, there's times there's, I remember I was in Yellowstone a few years back and there was some bison. It was beautiful. It was snowing and I pulled over and they immediately kind of surrounded the car and I just was not going to get out <laughs> as pretty as it was. It's like, they're just too close. You know, yeah. you know, you see other people get out and they, you know, pay the price. So I think awesome. a lot of it is just understanding how dangerous the animals can be and exercising a lot of caution and being aware of your, uh, of your surroundings. So you go to these trips you is it it's a it's a workshop too it depends uh i only do a few workshops right now we had we just finished africa and uh, we have three workshops in costa rica but a lot of the trips i go anything in the u.s right now i do is all just me doing it by, on my own just my wife and i we go okay. and uh, sometimes usually there's a project wrapped up in it at minimum there's a video or two wrapped up in it but a lot of times, almost every time we're going, it's to get photos for a specific project I'm working on. It's like, okay, when I was doing the bird and flight book, we were spending a lot of time in Florida and going to places where I could get birds in flight. And even when we were in places like Yellowstone, we were kind of emphasizing birds in flight. So, you know, it all depends on which, I'm sorry, it all depends on where we're, uh, what, what project we're going on and where, you know, that's going to determine where we go and for how long. But uh, it's, almost, it's, it's, you know, always a work trip. It's always a work trip. Nice. So if, if anybody is interested in, you know, upcoming events, the, uh, your website. Uh, yeah, best, best Bets Newsletters. The newsletters, right? Yeah, I have an email newsletter. Sign up for that. 
because when we do workshops, they do sell out quickly. At this point, we're not sure if we're, I think we're taking 2023 off and uh, we're not sure what, you know, when we're going to, or what we're going to do after that. But for right now, we're taking it off. We have some uh, family issues, health issues, not mine or my wife's, but uh, that are going on right now. So we're going to probably stay in the country and probably not do workshops next year for sure. So, so once we're through the Costa Rica workshops this year, that's going to be it indefinitely. So <laughs> and, what, what, your, your website is Backcountry Gallery. Yep, right? backcountrygallery.com. Backcountry I'll have, uh, we're going to be doing, you know, lots more videos, lots, you know, I have, I have multiple book and video projects planned as well as I say that upcoming Z9 guide. Currently the uh, Nikon autofocus book I have does cover the Z9 very thoroughly. It goes over so so much stuff. I see so many people struggle with autofocus on that camera. It's just like, just read the book. I promise you won't struggle anymore. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, there's, all, all, you know, but backcountrygallery.com, that'll get you to everything. The store links are there. We have the forum uh, as well. We have BCG forums. And uh, if you have questions that you want to ask, you can ask them over there. I am way better at answering questions or your your question stands a lot better chance of getting answered asking in the forum than trying to contact me directly because I just get so much email I just can't answer everything. So yeah, you're, in the forum, a lot of times I answer it in the forum too because I like that more people can see the answer because a lot of people have those same questions. So hey, hey uh if if I can Vog and sure. I just wanted to Jeff Neville, Jeffrey Neville, who is a big fan of yours, he couldn't be in here today and I promised him I would let I would actually speak for him. Okay. He wanted to talk about how, how much of a fan he is of yours and he's enjoyed your eBooks thoroughly. Oh, thank you so much. He's a big fan. He's always on your uh, site, uh, checking out everything that comes out. And he just wanted to make sure that I That's pass really nice. that on to you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, your forum is active, man. You you got a lot of people there. That's great. You know, yeah, we so. were surprised. Uh, we weren't. I, I had one. I had talked about my wife and I had talked about putting a forum up for a long time because we get so much email and it's just impossible for me to answer every. I'd be doing nothing but email all day. But we had talked about it for a while, and I wanted to make sure we had enough people that would be interested. That you don't want to put a forum up and get a message a day or something. You know, it's it dies before it even gets started. But uh, yeah, we've been surprised and very very pleased with the uh, number of people that are in the forum and not only that they just uh for the most part it's been very very civil i mean Good. a lot of times you get uh we have some great moderators over there now though they help out a ton and i want to thank them there if they're watching thank you and uh but they do a great job making sure that everybody kind of stays in line and everybody you know for the most part everyone's real polite and you know you get honest answers to your questions. And a lot of times they'll answer the question as well or better than I can. And they'll do it in less time. <laughs> no, I find that too. In the live streams, we have so many knowledgeable people in the chat and it's very civil. We have a great community going. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. And it's uh, people that shoot everything, not just Nikon, although we may be Nikon centric. Right. But uh, right. yeah, I, I, I find that as well. The chat seems to answer a lot of the questions and, and I really enjoy, you know, sharing with them and they share with me. Yeah, no, the, the, the photography, just, I think the photography community in general is, is, is a pretty decent, is, they're very civil. I think they're one of the uh, easier ones to get along with. And a lot of times it, when you meet people out in the woods and out in the field and that, they're, you know, it's the same way. Everyone's really friendly. Most of the time, you, you know, it, it's, I think that the, uh, the rude ones are very much the exception to the rule. You, you don't come across them and, you know, we just yeah. bam. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, they police themselves over there real well, too. And that's very good. They do. It's nice. Um, there is a question by uh, Ronald Pollard. He's he's a professional shooter, uh, photographer, and he's shooting the the Z9. And he, this is a question. I, I, we've we've talked about it around it and everything else. But oh, yeah. I'm going to let him ask it his way here as you can read it on the screen. Please tell me what factors cause people to struggle. OK. With Nikon. I, I am not a hundred percent sure that people are really struggling a heck of a lot more with Nikon than they are other brands. Uh, when I first picked up my A1, it was, there was a learning curve there and it was, uh, it was significant. You know, you're looking at, because everything is different. So I'm not, sh I think there's an idea out there that perhaps that you pick up an A1 and instantly you just point it at what you want and you get sharp photos. And that's not, 
necessarily the case. But I think the biggest factor as far as what people are struggling with with Nikon, I think it's what we had talked a little bit about early. We touched on it where you have people that are never shot mirrorless before, never shot a pro body before. And they're jumping from like a D500 or D7500 or a D850, a 750, whatever, one of those mid-range to prosumer type cameras. And they're like, oh, I'm going to get this. And in a lot of cases, they wouldn't normally do that. But the Z9, I'm sorry, the Z9 is the one that has the features they want. So they jump into it. And I think they get in over their heads. I think that's part of the struggle. Nikon also has a lot of different AF modes to choose from. And I think sometimes that causes confusion because people don't have... Uh, a super clear idea about which ones work best for what type of subject. And that's, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, shameless plug. That's one, one of the things my book goes over in excruciating detail is, you know, this is what I use here and this is why I use it. But I think a lot of it is just, there's a, there's a learning curve to using the Z9. And I think there's a lot of people that think that they should be able to shortcut that. And it just doesn't really work that way. And I don't know that it's any really that much harder to use than other cameras in, in that respect. I think some of it is people are expecting something to happen that's not, and some of it's just not understanding how mirrorless shooting works. For instance, one of the things that kind of plagues all PDAF sensors, as far as I know anyway, is that when they, they'll, they'll get stuck on a background and not want to focus on a closer subject. The solution, regardless if it's Canon, Sony, or Nikon, is to grab the focus ring and you pull focus closer, then it'll usually grab on, or not to use an area, what AF area that's so wide that it's causing an issue. But, you know, and that's just as an example, but, you know, people don't understand that. And then, hey, it's the camera's fault, but no, it's, it's not. This is how this, this is, you know, a new way of thinking. And it's not really a fault with the system. It's just how the system works. It's like when we were shooting DSLRs, when you're shooting a full frame DSLR, you know, one of the things that was aggravating is that we couldn't get our AF point all the way to the corners and up at the top and the right. bottom. That We had a limited AF field, but we just said, okay, well, we're going to work around that. And this is, I think, kind of the same thing with mirrorless is that there's just some different workflow field workflows that you have to become accustomed to. And once you do, it's not, it's not really all that hard, but no, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know that. I think it's just not, I think the biggest factor to answer the question, I guess, succinctly is it's just not really understanding what each AF mode does and what it's meant for and how it interacts with subject detection. I think that's probably the answer. That seems to be where people are struggling. They kind of mix everything together when it really shouldn't be. I think you're absolutely right. Because when I got my Z9, I, I was one of the idiots that thought, hey, all these wonderful features, all I have to do is turn the camera on and, and literally wave it across a bunch of bushes and it will throw, it out, throw it out there. Yeah. And you'll get yeah. All hangers. Uh, I mean, the truth is, is that, uh, you have to learn the camera and all the different focusing modes and uh, everything else. Uh, but you can always go back to, and I was telling some people this because I wouldn't answer questions right away. I, I needed time to play with the camera. Same here. Learn, Same learn here. the camera. But you can go to a uh, single point focus, recompose, and it works just like your DSLR, at least for me. But yeah, so if yeah, all, all else fails, then you go back to what you were shooting with your D6, D5, D4, whatever. Yeah, it, it does. And that's actually, I think that's one of the things Nikon did that might be throwing people off a little bit is sometimes you have to shoot the Z9 as if it was a DSLR. And then right. all of a sudden your results are like, oh, hey, yeah, this is working. Yeah. But, uh, and I think some people are expecting it to do things that it's not really designed to do to. And, and, you know, and that, that, that was me. I had to learn, you know, the hard way. I'm expecting some magic to come out of it. Yeah, it is a magic camera. No doubt about that with all the features that it has. But you have to learn those features. And Oh, yeah, I for think, sure. I think that for was sure. the mistake for me and so many other people, too. Yeah. Yeah. Man, no, I, look at these no, comments, dude. That. You're getting all these nice comments. <laughs> You're probably used to it. <laughs> Jeez, thank you. Guys. Yeah. My wow, yeah, thank you guys. My final question for you mm. is do you spend some time on YouTube? If you do, who are your favorite YouTubers? I mean photography slash. I don't spend a ton of time on YouTube. I should spend more. Um, let me think here. Who do I see? I I'm I'm sorry, I'm drawing like a complete blank. Um I like uh Vahography. <laughs> yes i like photography yeah, that, that's the, that's the channel right there man i mean what else is there um no i yeah i mean a lot of times i'll have just kind of random people showing up in my feed um one of the guys i do follow uh uh steve Mathias or methus i can't yep. remember his name right you know who he is right yeah he's yeah I, I like him uh i jeez jared Pollen. 
Jared oh, no. I do watch some of Jared's videos, especially when, you know, you know he, he, he's all right sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a good guy. Um, I think, I think he really does his best to, uh, to, to try to, uh, get as much content out there as he can. And, uh, I don't know how he does. I don't know how he does it, to be honest. I, I if I get a video or two out a month, it's a miracle, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But uh, anyway, I just I just did a video on uh, calling the Northrop side from their some of the things they were saying about Nikon. It got some some traction. People really liked what I did. Oh, did <laughs> they? Yeah. People, and some people were like, "You burned some bridges there." I'm like, "Hey, man." Yeah. I have to say. Anyway, yeah, man, I don't. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't follow them too closely. <laughs> hey, here. Here, here's a good question, Steve. You might answer real quick for somebody. And yeah. again, this is what we like about the live streams is people get answers to their questions, immediate, immediate feedback. But anyway, um, do you have any plans to do any like short two to three day workshops here in the U S here stateside? Not at the moment. We've talked about stuff like that before, but right at this moment, just like I say, because of our current situation, I don't want to have anything scheduled. Okay. So yeah, for right now, um, yeah, probably not. If you were to do something, uh, you know, what, how big is the group and how much does it cost usually for, for like a two, three day workshop with you out somewhere? It would depend where we were doing and how we were doing it. Because if it were something in the U S I, I, I might go for a little bit smaller groups just because of the transportation issue. Like when we do Costa Rica, we do uh, 10 people, which is almost too, too many, I think, but um, we have the vehicles and we have the guides and we have the, we have the infrastructure there, the logistical uh, backbone, if you will, to do stuff like that. And one of the guides that helps me, I'd mentioned him before, Dennis is also an absolutely fantastic photographer. In fact, I'm going to plug him here. If you go to Osa photography on uh, Instagram, he's really, really good photographer. And, uh, but he and I kind of, you know, he, he started off as just kind of a guy that was driving us around finding animals for us, but he does such a good job with photography. And I've been working with him uh, side by side for, uh, for a while now. I think Rose and I figured out we did about 17 workshops down there in the last few years. So, I mean, he and I spend a lot of time together. He thinks like I do, he shoots like I do. So it's like having two people along with that. So uh, that, that makes it nice. But uh, for like smaller stuff where it's, you know, basically I don't have any real backup like that. Yeah, I don't like to do huge groups. Even eight in Africa felt like it was a little bit much. So it'd probably be something more like you know six. I don't that's know. That's not that's a good size. Yeah, that's yeah, a good that's yeah. a good size. You'll actually learn and ask questions, and you know, right, like, right. It'll it makes, get I think personal. It makes it easier. You know, it gets personal, and you know, you help out. That's great, man. I, yeah. I don't wow. know if people understand the logistics behind doing something like that. It's not oh. an easy task to pull off, and you know, a lot of people will hem and haw about a price or something, but you have no idea when you're putting something like that together, all that goes into all that it's is not, considered. No, thankfully my wife is the one that organizes those because if it wasn't for, so shout out to Rose. Uh, if it wasn't for her, I would not do workshops, period. There's Thank you. No Rose. Way, there's just no way I want to talk to people on a daily basis about what luggage to take or, <laughs> you know, what clothes to wear, which what what their airline schedule looks like or things like that. I just can't, I, I don't have the time or the, uh, uh, the mental fortitude to do things like that. That's so, awesome. She does. And she does a fantastic job. In fact, one of the funny things is uh, a lot of times our workshop participants end up, uh, one of our workshop participants started it and she passes it on. And then by the end of it, everyone's saying it, but they're like, yeah, this is a Rose Perry workshop featuring Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is. It really That's is. Great. I do the teaching part and she does yeah. the, she does basically everything else. And the hard a, part. A great job. She does the hard part. She does. She does the hard part. Yeah. And it is, like you say, people don't realize, but there are just so many factors that go into producing a good workshop. That's it's, awesome. It's, it's, so, it's, it's so, it's so tough. It's so tough, yeah. especially well, with we, COVID that really made it harder. Well, here's a heartfelt you. thank you to Rose. Thank you. Yes, Rose. For thank sure. You. For sure. Well, uh, yeah, man. I want to thank you. This was great. Uh, thank you. Wow. You Toasty know. with my little drink here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you ever come to L.A., Los Angeles? You know, anytime soon? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I've i never been to L.A. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Is there a lot of wildlife out there? <laughs> yeah, wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> Not the kind that you want to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. 
but uh <laughs> but hey man i want to thank you steve uh yeah, thank you, you for know, having me guys i really appreciate it this was awesome and i want to thank everybody in the chat you guys were great too chuck, yeah thank you for all the chuck, questions chuck as always we can we can be here for you know hours just answering questions but this was very informative um I, one day if we ever meet up man i'd love just to hang out with you it'd be really nice it'd be really cool man that would be awesome that would so, be awesome yeah guys so if you really enjoyed this tuesdays 10 a.m uh pacific standard time biography talk next week we have the the legend the great jerry guionis on <laughs> steve thank you chuck and this thank was you so great. much no, yeah. thank you. And I just want to say, uh, Steve, now I know you're as genuine as you are in your videos and everything else. Being in a live stream is a completely different animal. A lot of people don't understand. No, no, but, it is uh, different. Yes. And, you know, I, I thank you. Actually, a lot of people, I'm sure, have been thanking you over here in the chat for all the I tips have, you I provided. Thank you, guys. And, you know, look forward to that big Z9 guide everybody's asking for. I know well, you're busy, man. I'm looking forward man, to having it done. <laughs> no, it's right. gonna it's gonna be it, it's gonna be nice if you're a wildlife shooter at least it'll be i think it'll it'll be very helpful it's uh it, yeah. every book i write ends up being a bigger monster than i thought it would be <laughs> <laughs> i know patrick patrick is a, a photojournalist here in the orange county area oh thank uh, you patrick yeah he's he's done a few breaking photos he oh, has wow. a five he uses a 500 fl with a d5 and d6 yeah, I like Shout that 500. Super versatile lens. That 500 f4 is a good lens. Yeah. So, all right, guys, have a good day. Good night. Good morning. Like and all subscribe. Right. Photography. More talks on the way. And always, Chuck, Steve. Yep. Thank you so much, everybody in the chat. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. <laughs>